According to the standard economic model, markets are efficient in the allocation of resources. However, the dynamic relationship between supply and demand, which produces equilibrium, does not factor in the social cost of economic activity. In order to supply consumers with electricity, private firms often burn fossil fuels such as oil, gas, coal and peat. This creates large quantities of carbon dioxide, CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. CO2 is primarily responsible for global warming. The social cost of global warming is very high. Significant rises in average global temperatures between 2 and 4.5 degrees Celsius will cause the poles to melt and sea levels to rise globally, along with extreme weather conditions, storms, floods, heat waves and large snowfalls, as well as making whole regions uninhabitable or unable to support large populations, which will place greater strain on resources, increasing conflict and creating climate refugees. Global warming is a negative externality of the market. Markets are inefficient and prone to failure. Essentially, an externality occurs when the activity of suppliers, private firms, and consumers, buyers, negatively impacts the welfare of bystanders. Robert N. Stavins asserts this problem to be the modern manifestation of the tragedy of the commons. The Earth's habitat and delicate ecosystem has been nearly irreparably damaged by centuries of unfettered economic expansion by ignorance of both suppliers and consumers to ignore the social cost in favour of maximising the benefit to themselves, by the inability to form a consensus solution by both private and public agents, and by a cynical and destructive dis disinformation campaign designed to inhibit the awareness of the true social cost of consuming certain goods and services. Our global environment is at risk because it is a common resource. We all benefit from our use of common resources. It supplies the necessities for life, clean water, clean air, food, etc. Common resources such as minerals, metals and fossil fuels have also powered society to provide higher standards of living. A common resource is a type of public good. It is by its very nature non-excludable, meaning you can't stop someone from benefiting from it without having paid. Common resources are also rival, which means that its value diminishes after each use. Reducing the quality of air we breathe through pollution negatively affects bystanders, which is defined as a negative externality. The presence of negative externalities causes markets to fail. Negative externalities stem from the inherent properties of common resources. Crucially, price is absent because of the phenomenon of free riders, those who benefit from a common resource but don't have to pay. Therefore, the consequence or social cost of a negative externality is ignored by suppliers. The absence of a true price prevents the efficient and equitable allocation of resources or prevents the optimal social outcome. Essentially, the free market is unreliable because it produces an inefficient equilibrium. Ultimately, suppliers and consumers are not operating rationally. Instead, they are self-interested and do not consider the long-term impact of their behavior. Commons is an important example that illustrates the issues surrounding our use of common resources and the economic necessity of sustainability. The tragedy of the commons is as relevant today as it was hundreds of years ago. Essentially, as groups continue to utilize common resources, such as grazing land, clean air, their value diminishes. Historically, the tragedy of the commons was caused by individuals overgrazing and depleting the common land surrounding most English villages. The grazing land could not sustain the number of sheep herds, and the land became barren and unable to support any sheep at all. The individuals involved were unable to come to a collective agreement that was beneficial to all. Instead, they focused on maximizing the benefit they gained from using a common resource. The contemporary manifestation of the tragedy of the commons is a global issue. Economic activity, energy production, industrial farming and highly developed transportation networks are causing global warming through the production of carbon dioxide or CO2. This will result in sea level rises, drought, disease, conflict, migration and will ultimately impact all human activity on earth. In order to prevent the ultimate depletion of our environment, effective government intervention is required. 
Economic markets are imperfect and regularly require the intervention of governments to achieve the social optimum or the socially efficient outcome. Ideally, governments intervene to rebalance supply and demand to achieve a more efficient equilibrium, thus minimizing the impact of negative externalities and protecting the welfare of bystanders. Bystanders are not compensated by the market, for example, ill health that they suffer due to air pollution or the cost of foreign aid to regions experiencing dramatic climate change, like the Mekong Delta in southern Vietnam. Who will pay the cost of the impact of sea level rises? The IPCC has estimated that by the year 2100, there will be a one meter rise in sea levels, which will displace 100 million people in Asia and 14 million people in Europe. What will the cost of solving that negative externality be in the future? How can governments intervene now to prevent these problems arising? Private solutions to pollution and global warming have so far been largely ineffective. Pollution and global warming is a hugely complicated problem that requires the input of numerous vested groups such as national governments, private firms and advocacy groups. Governments working through super, supranational bodies like the UN, EU and various other trade blocs have had to work together to seek an effective response to man-made climate change and pollution. Government intervention, intervention ultimately seeks to change the behaviour of suppliers and consumers by manipulating market forces, supply and demand. Governments can intervene with both command and control policies or market-based policies. Market-based policies, believed by economists to be the most effective, seek to incentivize private firms by manipulating the price signal. This is achieved by internalizing an externality through taxation. Governments can also legislate or regulate polluters by prohibiting the dumping of hazardous waste. Governments accept that an outright ban on CO2 pollution is far too costly. Because our transport network would collapse, we'd have no electricity, hospitals would shut, and essentially the economy would collapse. Therefore, there is an acceptable level of pollution determined by a cost-benefit analysis. Economists prefer Pigovian taxes over regulation because private firms respond better to incentives. Thus, taxing a paper mill for extra ton of effluent emitted will induce the firm to find a solution through investing in innovative technology, for example. Pigovian taxes also raise revenue for the state and further enhance economic efficiency. Another solution proffered by economists is tradable pollution permits. Private firms are permitted to pollute up to a certain amount. However, different industries, such as paper and steel, for example, have different pollution outputs from their production processes. Therefore, for argument's sake, the limit is 300 tons per annum per factory, with the paper mill emitting 200 tons. This would allow a steel mill, which produces more pollution, to purchase the paper mill surplus of 100 tons. Thus, the steel mill is allowed to emit 400 tons without being subjected to punitive Pigovian taxes. The Pigovian tax will incentivize bargaining. In 2002, the EU implemented the European Trading Scheme, ETS, which is a system of pollution permits. Effectively, ministers set up a market to trade pollution permits for carbon dioxide. EU ministers view this as a means of more efficiently keeping the environment clean. However, the ETS has been criticized for being far too lenient to polluters. Furthermore, the global recession caused a depression in industrial output due to the fall in demand. The price of permits fell too. This resulted in a lower yield in expected efficiencies because firms were no longer incentivized to invest in improving their technology. Irish plastic bag policy. In order to understand the reasoning behind the introduction of this policy, there are certain questions that need to be asked. In previous years, supermarkets and other similar establishments use paper bags and the majority of consumers use shopping trolleys for their groceries. Why was the introduction of plastic bags required? Was it due to the externalities caused by paper bags? Or was this a way in which the government could recoup money through taxes from the consumer. 
Has the introduction of this policy been seen as a positive externality for the country and its environment? In March 2002, Fianna Fáil Minister for the Environment, Noel Dempsey, introduced a levy of 15 cents on the cost of a disposable plastic bag. The primary objective for in introducing this policy was the encouragement of environmentally sustainable behaviour, in particular to encourage the consumer to reduce the amount of disposable plastic bags being used, to address the level of pollution caused by this product and to combat the effects of this product was having on the environment. The policy was also implemented due to the financial impact the po pollution was imposing on society in terms of cleaning it up. Using plastic bags generates negative externalities and therefore a tax will make people pay the social cost. The cost of the bag was at a sufficiently high price in order to motivate the consumer into bringing reusable bags. The introduction of this policy had an instant effect on consumer behaviour, with a reduction in plastic bag usage from a projected 328 bags per capita to 21 bags per capita overnight. However, this did not achieve the required result, as the aim of this policy was to have a lower usage per capita. Therefore, in July 2007, the price increased to the current value of 22 cents per bag. All levies and taxes collected from this policy are submitted into the Environmental Fund and are utilised within different areas of environmental departments. According to figures released in 2013, through the House of the Oireachtas, this policy has been an immense benefit to the country in financial terms, with revenue increasing from 10.4 million in 2002 to 14.2 million in 2012, with an overall intake of over 200 million euros. An unintended consequence of the plastic bag levy was an increased demand for paper bags. The production of paper, however, is also a highly polluting process, not only in terms of CO2 production, but also in the production of hazardous and poisonous chemicals such as dioxins. Dioxins are a group of chemicals formed by the burning of household and industrial waste, and they are also formed in the making and bleaching of paper pulp. Studies have linked dioxins to cancer, interrupted hormones, generative damage such as reduced sperm counts, neurological effects in children and adults, immune system changes and skin disorders. The repercussions of this negative externality will have huge financial costs to the health sector globally. One of the most extensive corporate scandals of our time was brought to us by the internationally known car manufacturer of Volkswagen. In an attempt to appear more environmentally friendly than they really are, the corporate giant has been caught in the act of installing defeat devices to their vehicles during emissions tests. These so-called defeat devices is a type of software that can be installed to the car, allowing the cars to produce false results in lab tests. However, once the software was turned off and the cars were used normally, they would pollute up to 40 times more nitrogen oxide than what is the legal limit. The scandal was uncovered in the US, where nearly half a million vehicles with the defeat device installed into them were used. In the UK, there are about 1.2 million vehicles affected, and as many as 11 million in total in Europe and the US. As per the Clean Air Act, instated by the United States Environmental Protection Agency to improve the air quality in the US and to protect the stratospheric ozone layer. Volkswagen is now facing penalties of $18 billion. This is a sum roughly $400,000 per car. This scandal can be assumed to impact the German economy as well as the economy in Europe as a whole. Volkswagen is currently the employer of 300,000 workers in Germany and a total of 600,000 workers internationally. The company has not indicated that they will be laying people off as a result of the economic damage to the company, however this might be expected in the future. In regards to the pollution versus engine performance, there will always be a trade-off. By stating laws 
that sets a limit for the amount of emissions allowed, the fuel efficiency will be affected, leading to the car being more expensive to produce, buy and drive. The Paris Climate Summit, or COP21, is taking place in Paris in December 2015. This summit of world leaders is viewed as being crucial to preventing the catastrophic climate change. The purpose of the summit is to monitor the world's progress of dealing with global warming and climate change, as well as to negotiate agreements and set targets for reducing greenhouse gases. The serious overall goal of the summit is to create a legally binding agreement between all the world's countries to lower emissions sufficiently to keep global warming below the 2 degrees Celsius threshold that scientists say is necessary to maintain the health of the planet and the well-being of all. It is considered essential to head off the worst effects of climate change, such as severe flooding and droughts. Crucially, public opinion has shifted dramatically, perhaps due to the recent experience of extreme storms, flooding, etc., and the diligent work of committed scientists and activists. Public opinion has followed the science, and interest in the event is very high. There is a public demand to pay attention to this problem more than there ever has been before. Politicians, likewise, are also catching up. Maybe because it's expedient to do so, or maybe because they are reflecting the will of the people. However, in recent years, politicians in particular have been vocal in denying global warming, and the public are not so willing to accept this stance anymore. The private firms who are responsible for much of the CO2 pollution have engaged in a dishonest campaign to discredit the science around climate change and ultimately confuse the public. The media too is responsible for confusing the public by providing climate deniers an equal footing with climate scientists in televised debates. However, things have changed as John Oliver... Their hats. <laughs> the, the debate on climate change should not be whether or not it, it exists, it's what we should do about it. There is a mountain of research on this topic. Global temperatures are rising, heat waves are becoming more common, sea surface temperatures are also rising, glaciers are melting, and of course no climate report is complete without the obligatory photo of a polar bear balancing on a piece of ice. <laughs> uh, the only accurate way to report that one out of four Americans are sceptical of global warming is to say, a poll finds that one out of four Americans are wrong about something. <laughs> because a survey of thousands of scientific papers uh, that took a position on climate change found that 97% endorsed the position that humans are causing global warming. And I think I know why people still think this issue is open to debate, because on TV, it is. And it's always one person for, one person against. And it's usually the same person for. Bill Nye and Marsha Blackburn, welcome both of you to Meet the Press. Bill Nye joins us now, along with climate change skeptic Mark Morana. Joining me now to go head to head, Bill Nye, science educator and CEO of the Planetary Society. In the crossfire, Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill Nye, the science guy who believes in man made global warming. Yeah, that's right. More often than not, it's Bill Nye the science guy versus some dude. And, <laughs> and when you look at the screen, it's 50-50, which is inherently misleading. If there has to be a debate about the reality of climate change, and there doesn't, then there is only one mathematically fair way to do it. Last Week Tonight presents a statistically representative climate change debate. Good evening. Joining me tonight, a climate change denier and, naturally, Bill Nye Science Guy. <laughs> uh, so, Bill... Bill? John? Yep. Humans are causing climate change? No wait, question. Wait, 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 wait. Before we begin, on, in the interest of mathematical balance, I'm going to bring out two people who agree with you, climate sceptic, and Bill Nye, I'm also going to bring out 96 other scientists. <laughs> uh, it's a little unwieldy, but this is the only way you can actually have a representative discussion. Uh, so, yeah, please, please file in. Again, again, this is, this is going to make the debate difficult. We shouldn't really be having it in the first place. But, uh, so... Representationally, climate sceptic, please make a case against climate change. Well, I just don't think all the science is in yet. It's settled. OK, and what is the overwhelming view of the entire scientific community? Well... <laughs> OK, 